Well, hello again. Welcome back to uh, Engineering 201 Electrical Fundamentals. And we uh, finished up talking about operational amplifiers last time. And I wanted to uh, move forward and start to look at energy storage elements. The two energy storage elements that there really are and that we're going to talk about are capacitors <coughs> and uh, inductors. And we'll start first starting talking about uh, capacitors and then we'll move along before we're done with this subject and talk about inductors. So if we think about capacitors, what a capacitor is, is it's uh, two charged surfaces that are separated by some distance. We usually think of a couple of uh, uh, parallel plates. So I have a plate here and a plate there. Sometimes we'll change the geometry fairly significantly on these. We could uh, put some uh, dielectric material in here, maybe um, s some sort of a, a paste or something even something maybe like wax paper, and then take a couple of uh, foil surfaces for our plates, and then we could roll it all up. So sometimes uh, they, they will not look like this at all. They'll, they'll have very different geometry. And it won't take very long, and we're going to try and put this whole thing in what we call a black box and really just look at the terminal effects of it. But uh, for now, we could talk about the, the, the parallel plates. And we can say that the capacitance uh, C, that's the capacitance, the uh, governing equation is that uh, charge divided by voltage. And uh, so that gives us, I mean, if we rearrange that equation there, we have that uh, charge is equal to C, the capacitance, times the voltage uh, V. There's a uh, capacitance. And uh, this is why when we first started out talking about uh, charge in terms of coulombs, I said don't abbreviate coulombs with C because it's much more traditional to abbreviate capacitance with C. So our capacitance, our charge is equal to our capacitance times our voltage. The other thing here is you'll start to see me writing in lower quanti uh, lowercase quantities because as we start to look at capacitors and inductors and, and so on, we're going to have time varying entities. So we usually used uppercase letters for things that were constant and we'll start to use lowercase letters now for things that can vary with respect to, to time. Well, this uh, capacitance is really also equal to the uh, permittivity constant, epsilon naught, times the cross, the, the area of this plate, times the dielectric constant K, divided by the distance between them. So we've got the uh, permittivity the permittivity constant, and then we've got the dielectric constant. And uh, a few things we could talk about the, uh, the dielectric. Maybe we could uh, look at uh, some values here, talk about a uh, vacuum, uh, air, titanium oxide, oil, water. We could talk about the uh, K that goes along with that. A vacuum is actually the standard. That is uh, 1.0. Air is actually 1.00054, so it's pretty close to a vacuum. Titanium oxide jumps up pretty substantially to about 100. Oil, um, 4.5. Water is about 78. So this actually uh, is, is kind of interesting. Uh, because if you think about, well, what if you uh, wanted to come up with a uh, level meter to figure out how the fluid level was in something, maybe you had something like water and you put a, a couple of leads in into here, and from these leads you have some circuitry that will query what its capacitance is. Well, when the uh, water is up here, the dielectric is, is not very much water and a lot of air, uh, and then when the uh, fluid is up here, the uh, dielectric is a lot more water and not as much air. So the capacitance between those would change. And we'll talk about uh, where we find capacitors and where this uh, phenomena is used in, in a little bit. Um, like I said, we're going to put this into a, a black box pretty soon and just worry about uh, this governing equation here. But uh, it, it suffice to say that the, the area is important. The larger the uh, plates, the larger the capacitance is going to be. And then the closer they are together, if we can keep them uh, from touching each other, keep the dielectric from getting broke down. As the dielectric gets thinner and thinner, you can start to have the dielectric breakdown, and that can be a, a problem. But we, as we get them thinner and thinner, we can increase the value of the capacitance. Well, um, a couple things that I, I should probably mention. The capacitance here is given units of farads. Capacitance 
is going to be coulombs per volt. So this, uh, maybe we'll say C, the uh, capacitance, is uh, coulombs per volt. So we see charge over voltage, coulombs per volt, which we define then as a farad, which is named after Michael Faraday, the, uh, the English physicist. Now, a one farad capacitor, we do have them. You can find one and two farad capacitors. They're usually a lower voltage capacitor for uh, audio systems or something like that. Someone building a stereo that they want to be able to break the back window out of their car, um, they're probably going to be looking for something like that. Other than that, we don't see... Uh, maybe in, in industrial applications we'd see them, but a one farad capacitor is a huge capacitor. Uh, physically, if even with a lower voltage, a one farad capacitor is going to be something the size of maybe an oatmeal container or something like that, or a scuba bottle. It's a, really a very large thing. Most of the time we have a small fraction of a uh, farad. So we'll talk about uh, micro farads, which is uh, 10 to the minus 6 farads, or we might even talk about picofarads, which is 10 to the minus 12 farads. We do talk a little bit about nanofarads, 10 to the minus 9, but uh, probably the most common is microfarads, 10 to the minus 6, picofarads, 10 to the minus 12, because a, a farad is a very large number. Uh, you'd end up with, with plates that are literally almost, uh, you know, the, the size of an acre or something like that. So, uh, most of the time, we're, we're a small fraction of a, uh, of a ferret. Now, what's happening here is with this charge plate, we could say that uh, this has a positive charge, and then down here, this has a negative charge, and that's going to set up an um, electric field. And that electric field in there, we can store energy in an electric field. And that's the difference between capacitors and inductors and resistors. Resistors don't store energy, but capacitors and inductors are energy storage elements. Capacitors store that energy in an electric field. Inductors will be storing it in a magnetic field. And this electric field, you might think that, uh, well, if these plates are separated by some distance, the circuit is open. We couldn't have current going through there, but you actually can. If you look, um, you can talk about a uh, current going through here because what's known as a displacement current is set up. So this electric field gives way to a displacement current. So this traditional or conduction current uh, is transferred across this gap by the electric field and the displacement current. Um, this is the symbol that we have for a capacitor. Sometimes this uh, lower piece will, will be curved. You might see a symbol like this. This just means an electrolytic capacitor, how the capacitor is, is made. Uh, usually we'll have plus and minus the value of the capacitor there. Then we'd have some voltage across here usually as a function of time, and I of t, because those are probably going to be changing with respect to time. Let me uh, show you some examples of this. I've got a variety of uh, capacitors that I can show you here. This is a uh, 0.015 microfarad capacitor. So I'll put those down here where you can see them a little better. looks about like a, a nickel there. This is a, a kind of 22 microfarads. Okay, so there's 22 microfarads. And you'll notice that there's a groove, and the groove on this right here is usually the positive side. So if this is polarized and needs to be put in properly, that would be the positive side. This one has a groove on both sides, so it could go in either way, and it's uh, 20 microfarads. And this one here, again, has a groove on one side, so that needs to be the positive side. I've put these all in positive up, and I think this is uh, 20 microfarads also. So what's the difference between this 20 microfarads and this 20 microfarads, other than this has a positive end and this is non-polarized, would probably be the amount of voltage. This will probably, either is an older one, or will take more voltage. Um, 
we got 150 volts DC on that one, whereas this is only 50 volts DC. So the larger one typically will take more voltage. So when you start thinking about capacitors, you not only need to uh, be concerned yourself with the amount of capacitance, but the amount of voltage. Because if you start uh, putting too much voltage in here for the way the capacitor is built, uh, you'll blow through that dielectric. Well, we could start bringing some really big ones in here. Um, this one looks a little like that. And uh, it's 20 microfarads. So there's 20 microfarads and there's 20 microfarads. What's the difference between those? Again, the voltage. The small one's 50 volts DC, whereas this larger one's 450 AC. And there's, again, a big difference between AC and DC on that. So suffice to say this is rated for a, a tremendous, um, much more uh, energy. A uh, lot more voltage. Here's the last one that I'll show you. I think it came out of a microwave, 0.74 microfarad. So that's the uh, the last one. And again, that would be a very high voltage capacitor. This is 2400 volts AC. So very large capacitor there. Well, let me go ahead and uh, set these aside. As I do this, we should probably talk a little bit about capacitor safety. It'll be the first time we've talked about something that will really store charge, and that can be uh, very dangerous. There's usually, when you start to work on something, protocols on how you need to turn the power off. But now we're talking about a, uh, uh, a capacitor that can hold charge. So we can turn the power off. We can unplug it. We can think we're doing everything very carefully, and we can still... Um, shock ourselves, electrocute ourselves, damage other components because the capacitor is charged up. So there may be some very specific uh, procedures and protocols to discharge that capacitor. Um, one thing uh, we'll notice on this uh, great big one, it actually has a resistor across it at all times, so uh, it uh, couldn't, it it will not uh, maintain a charge. That charge would be dissipated through that uh, resistor. A capacitor like this, uh, all charged up, would easily be able to uh, melt a, a screwdriver. So uh, easily be able to to kill someone. So you you want to be very careful with that. Uh, people always talk about oh, they found in high school electronics charging at capacitors and throwing up people and stuff. And we're certainly not going to uh, tolerate that at all in the the laboratories here. It'd be very deadly, and we want to use a, a proper uh, care in that. So be careful with capacitors. They're going to be rated not only for their uh, capacitance in terms of farads, but also the amount of voltage that they can uh, uh, tolerate and, and work under. Well, I want to come back here to this picture, talk a little bit about what we could do with uh, capacitors and maybe uh, follow up on that a little more. Where do we see capacitors in everyday uh, life? Well, there's lots of places. Maybe that we have a uh, signal like this, and um, we've got some AC signal, and we uh, rectify that signal, fully rectify it, so we get something like this. Okay, and then if we use a capacitor, we could put a capacitor in this thing. So we add a capacitor to this. We might have the capacitor store up there, and it would uh, smooth this thing out a little bit. So as we convert from an AC signal to a DC signal, we might have capacitors in there. Uh, speaking of, of storing and then discharging, if you have a circuit like uh, this where we might uh, charge up a capacitor, so we'll have a, a switch here, and then we'll put the uh, capacitor in like this. So we're charging up the capacitor, and then at some point we could move that switch over to another contact here. So at some point we'd do that, and we'd discharge that capacitor through a load. So this might, we could have some sort of a light, and this would be a typical uh, flash on a, uh, a camera or something like that, where we would uh, charge this up for a long, quite a long period of time and then we could discharge that very briefly over a flash and get a very large flash out of a battery that really couldn't power that flash. So that's a, a typical flash circuit. Um, I mentioned using the uh, capacitance principle to, to come up with level industrial measurements and a lot of uh, electrical engineers and some mechanical engineers will go into instrumentation and industrial measurements. That's a big area. There's a neat tool, a capacitance manometer. They're relatively inexpensive and uh, very rugged. And what they basically have is the, um, 
a tube where you'd have a couple of pressures, P1 and P2. And then you have a diaphragm separating those, because if you don't, P1 is equal to P2. And let's say that uh, P1 is greater than P2. What that's going to do is cause that diaphragm to bulge, and you'll put a couple of electrodes in there, and the capacitance between these is going to change as that diaphragm gets closer to those, and that's a nice capacitance uh, manometer. They're uh, relatively inexpensive. They're very rugged. They uh, respond very quickly, so if you want to uh, do uh, fast pressure measurements, that, that's a, a good way to go. So we see capacitors in lots of uh, different places. Uh, the old-fashioned uh, TVs and whatnot were just chocked full of capacitors. That's a lot of times where people got into trouble um, with, with safety, uh, getting in there and getting shocked when they thought they shouldn't. Uh, microwaves also have uh, capacitors in them. So we see them in a lot of uh, areas. The, the other large capacitor that I brought in was from a sodium vapor, mercury vapor uh, light that you might see in a, a parking lot uh, or something like that. So we see them all around. Certainly worth studying. Well, what I'd like to do then is to go back and starting with um, this equation, okay, the governing equation for a capacitor, see if we can come up with other uh, expressions for the capacitor because we're going to, like I said, we put this into a black box and we just want to look at the terminal effects and how, if you tell me what the capacitor is and how much current's going through it, how much voltage there is. Or if you tell me the capacitor and how much voltage is across it, how much current is going through it. And then talk about also power and energy. So let's do that then. So we said we were going to start with uh, the charge, Q, is equal to the capacitance times the voltage, V. And I'm going to use lowercase because we've got probably time-varying quantities. And I'm going to then uh, go back and look at current as the time rate of change of charge. So I've got dQ dt. Remember, the uh, very early on, one of the first lectures, we talked about current as the time rate of change of charge. So there's just a change in charge. You could say it was a dq, delta Q over delta T. I'm going to talk a little bit about dQ dt because we're going to be using some ca uh, calculus sooner or later. Well, if I substitute this into here, and I'm going to take this as my uh, capacitance, which we can have varying capacitance. are kind of interesting. The, the plates move across each other, so you have more or less area in contact with each other. Uh, but we're going to take this as, for now, we're going to say that this is a constant. So you can have varying capacitance. Uh, obviously, we go back here, and if you were to take a water and add to that or, or subtract from it, you would have a varying capacitance. We'll take capacitance as constant, and when you substitute that in, then you can say that the current I is equal to the capacitance, because it's a constant, times the derivative of the voltage with respect to time. So I have I is equal to C dV dt. Okay. And this is probably worth uh, taking some time and looking at. So let's uh, note a few things here. Uh, one thing is no instantaneous change in terminal voltage. Okay, we can't allow an instantaneous change in terminal voltage because if an instantaneous change in terminal voltage dVdt that's going to force the current to be equal to infinity, right? Okay. So an instantaneous change in terminal voltage will put a zero in here for the dt, and to make that happen, we would have to have an infinite amount of current, which would uh, not be appropriate. So no instantaneous change in terminal voltage. That's one thing. The other thing is if the terminal voltage is constant, the current is zero.
Okay, so if the terminal voltage is constant, the current is zero. So dV dt, if there's a constant, that goes to zero. Zero times C would be zero, so you get the current is equal to zero. So we, that's why I was saying I'm starting to write with lower, uh, lower case values because we're usually looking at something that is time varying. You might say, well, I've done a little automotive work and we have capacitors in automotive systems. Uh, if you look at an old fashioned ignition system, they have what's known as a condenser. That's actually a capacitor to give you a nice crisp spark in your uh, spark ignition system. Um, but when you think about a system like that, and you look at the points opening or closing, which is essentially a switch opening and closing, you have a DC system that, yeah, is going along for a while, but then what happens? It turns off, and then it'll turn back on, and then it'll turn off, and so forth. So over time, is that terminal voltage constant over time? No, it's turning on and off. So even though it's a DC system, and maybe you say that you've got 12 volts DC system, it's turning on and off. So we, uh, uh, that's why we see capacitors in, in systems like that, because they're not necessarily constant, uh, but it is a constant that's being turned on and off. Uh, let's see, the last thing we could uh, say here is that the capacitor looks like an open circuit. The capacitor looks like an open circuit to a um, constant current, right? We said that if the um, if we have a constant current, if we have a constant voltage, the current is equal to zero. If it if we have a constant current, it looks like an open circuit. Okay, so we'll see as we do analysis that we'll um, be at some point um, as, uh, as as time goes on, uh, maybe we go past the time constant, we'll be looking at the capacitor as an open circuit. Okay, so the cap compares as an open circuit to a constant current. So those are some things to, to think about and we'll uh, revisit those probably quite a bit. Well let me take, uh, this, this is definitely worth a uh, box put a box around that. Let me take that and uh, rework it so I could say that I have uh, I times DT is equal to C DV, right? And I could rearrange that and say that DV is equal to 1 over C, solving for DV is equal to 1 over C times I DT, is that right? So if I wanted to get what uh, V was, or maybe V of T, I could say that that's the integral and we said C was constant, so I'll leave it on the outside. It'd come out of the integral anyway. So I have the integral from minus infinity to some time T of I. We could say I of T, but that's a little awkward than having our limit as T. So why don't I say I of X dx, where X is equal to T. Okay. And we could break up this integral if we wanted to. So I could say that uh, this would be equal to V of T would be equal to 1 over C times the integral from minus infinity to T naught of I of X dx plus the integral from T naught to T that is x is equal to t and x is equal to t naught of i of x dx. And what we're going to do with this um, piece here is we're going to say that this is the initial charge. So if I look at that as the initial charge I could then finally sum this up and say v of t is equal to 1 over c times uh, no, I've messed that up. I have 1 over C times this. If that's the initial charge, then I could say that this is equal to V at T naught plus now 1 over C times the integral from 
t naught to t of i of x dx, where x is equal to t and x is equal to t naught. So what this is, is this is the initial charge. Okay, this is the initial charge. That's that term right there. So we could say that that was the charge at t naught. So that's an important piece there. If you tell me what the capacitance is and you tell me what the current is and the initial charge, I can get the voltage. Okay. So we've got a couple important equations there. If you tell me here what the, the uh, voltage is and what the capacitance is, I can give you the current. So now we've got the current in terms of the capacitance and the voltage. We have the voltage in terms of the capacitance and the current. So a couple uh, important expressions. And we'll use these uh, when we get together next time. We've got an example that we'll go through and get to practice these. Let me try one, two more, actually. So I want to talk about power. So we've got uh, current. And here we have, we'll use a double arrow to be consistent, voltage. And that really deserves a box. Well, maybe I can get it to in there. An ugly box. Okay. There is our voltage. And now we want to talk about power. Okay. So power, P of T, and this can be time varying, would be equal to the product of voltage, V of T, times I of T. Okay, And uh, in some of those others, when I just said I, I was uh, referring most likely to I of T. At the lower case is a time varying quantity, as a function of time. So this is just a, a little more complete in that statement. So what can I say this is? Well, V of T, and do I have an expression for I of T? Yeah, I of T is C times dV of T, isn't it? So I could say that this was C, the value of the capacitance, times dV of T dT. So if you give me uh, the voltage, I'm going to take that voltage, and multiply it by the capacitance, then I'm going to multiply it again by the derivative of the voltage, and that's going to give me power. Okay, uh, this would of course be watts, which is uh, joules per second. We'll use uh, watts, but uh, in our next step, we'll need to know that it's joules per second. Now, if I look at energy, so energy, we'll use the uh, symbol W, W sub C, which makes sense because energy is like work, right? It has the same units of work. Power is the time rate of doing work. Um, so we could say that W sub C, I should probably make this a lower case. So this is a function of time, is equal to the integral from minus infinity to T of P of T which would be what? The integral from minus infinity to t of c v of x dv x dx dx because x is equal to t and x is equal to minus infinity. So I could say then that this was c is going to be constant so that's going to come out times the integral from minus infinity to t of uh, v x put a t in there call that v x v x d v x d x d x So let's see, what's that going to be? I can uh, reduce this really to what? C, the capacitance C times the integral from minus infinity to T of Vx times dVx, or no, just, yeah, yeah, d 
vx. So this would be equal to one half times the value of the capacitance C times V squared or V of X squared evaluated at minus infinity and T. So when you do that you could say then that this is equal to one half times C times V of T squared. Okay, because this would be x is equal to t and x is equal to minus infinity. When you go through that, you come up with one half c v t. Yeah. So I guess I wasn't putting boxes around things. There, it's a box for power. This would be our box for energy. And let's see, energy. This is going to be joules, isn't it? Okay, which makes sense. If power is joules per second, then energy would be joules. So we're going to take these four expressions here, the one for current, the one for voltage. This is a little bit ugly. If you're having a hard time seeing it on the video, again, it will be shown on the PDF. Maybe a little bit easier. Your author also probably does a cleaner job in the textbook of going through this. Uh, we'll be looking at the power and then also the energy. So we'll take an example, we'll go through and we'll uh, evaluate all four of these and then we will graph all four of these and I think that will um, be a good example for us and that's what we'll do next time. So uh, keep watching the, uh, the videos, keep practicing the homework and uh, take care till then. Thank you.